welcome to you all and thank you for joining our literary, our third literary cocktail hour with distinguished authors from, from the Stationers Company. Um, we really are very, very grateful for you all taking time out to join us this evening and even more grateful for the positive feedback that we've received for the previous, um, previous events. So thank you very much. As you're probably aware, the Livery Committee endeavours to raise funds and in fact just two weeks ago we handed over a cheque for over 24,000 to the company but also to actually organise social events for all members of, of, and sections of the company. And it was last year that we decided to hold uh, regular literary lunches and we were entertained in Williamson's Tavern in October by Simon Heffer but then with the advent of Covid in June we moved to our Zoom format. The first one was with past master Christopher McCain and we were delighted again with the positive feedback and many thanks to both Christopher and Peter for a great evening. Last month we were entertained by court assistant Paul Wilson who discussed with Peter both his career which was absolutely fascinating especially as his period as a an official spy I think he described it as and his book also Hostile Money. So hopefully all of you that have ordered your book, um, Peter, sorry, Paul signed them last week and they were sent out so you should have received them by now. If you missed the, the, these two events then don't worry about it, they're on YouTube and you can get to them direct on the YouTube search engine or via the company website. So tonight I'm delighted that we've got the lovely Margaret Wills who's agreed to discuss her absolutely fascinating career uh, pre-becoming a best-selling author and her latest books with Peter. Her latest book is The Domestic Herbal, which was only published last month. Um, so, as with all our face-to-face -face meetings, you will have an opportunity to, to buy the books later and talk a little bit more about that um, at the end of the talk. So, tonight again, it's not a literary uh, lunch, but it's a cocktail hour. So please sit back, charge your glasses, and enjoy the conversation between Margaret and Peter. Peter, over to you. Thank you, Mike. And as we inch into autumn, here's Margaret Wills, publisher and author, or as she puts it, gamekeeper turned poacher. She's been a stationer since 2011, not only as a publisher and writer, but also with print in her blood. Her grandfather was a compositor. Her, uh, her grandfather was a compositor. Her great-grandfather was a printer. At the stationers, she soon joined the Library and Archive Committee. She's been very involved in curating the archive evenings. They've grown in recent years, as we know, from a, a kind of niche thing to a notable sold out high point of the company's year now. She continues that involvement, but she's now on the Hall and Heritage Committee. So welcome, Margaret. We're going to talk about your life in publishing, then your books with special reference to the one that uh, Mike has just held up for us, and then we'll take a brief look at what you're working on now, uh, a kind of local book. First of all, how you started. You were always a historian, you say. Yes, absolutely. From, from the age of five, I've been completely obsessed by history. Uh, and uh, a, a visit to Westminster Abbey to look at the monuments, rather than going to South End for the day, changed my life. It was as uh, instant as that, was it? It was. It was like a Damascene moment. How wonderful. And that continued then. You went to Oxford, you studied history, and then you had a lucky break with a, 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 a paper, an exam paper you didn't realise you could study. That's right. It was, uh, so uh, I was going to do American documents and then I happened to go into hall, the hall with disgusting food and, uh, and uh, sitting next to the person who, uh, who was very much the, the serious person of our group and I asked her what special subject she was doing because I was going to do American documents because my best friend was and she said uh, uh, architecture in the age of Wren and this completely kind of, uh, was a, a, uh, so I rushed around to my tutor immediately and said, uh, I, I want to do it, I want to do it. And she was a very distinguished historian and uh, uh, herself uh, uh, dis uh, in, uh, at Oxford. And so she got on the phone to Howard Colvin, who was the great architectural historian, who was re leading this, uh, uh, this uh, seminar and said to him, there was this wretched girl who just discovered 
uh, this, this course and could he, could he fit me in, which he did. And it was fantastic. And I stayed on and did a, 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 an extra year with him. Uh, so architecture in the age of Wren. And then I went on to do, I went backwards and did uh, um, a Tudor architecture and the Renaissance. And, and so that was, uh, you, you realise it's, it's, it's the opposite of Thomas Hardy, isn't it? It was luck. <laughs> Well, uh, two distinct, two instant moments uh, uh, charted your way forward. But what do you do with um, uh, those interests uh, once you come out of university? Well, I was very, very lucky. Um, again, uh, I um, I had uh, my in, while I was at university, uh, T. S. Eliot died uh, in April nineteen sixty five. And my uh, my cousin happened to be in charge of uh, rights and copyright at Faber and Faber, and was getting in a terrible state about trying to give permission because Valerie Elliot was very fierce about the uh, use of uh, her, her husband's uh, poetry. You had to get a permission for a, even one line, and so all the obituaries all over the world wanted this. So I said, "Well, why don't I come and help?" So I did go and help. Uh, Initially, it was going to be free of charge, but I was so assiduous, i.e. my typing was so poor, that, uh, that I was paid two and a half guineas a week. Uh, and I just thought, this is wonderful. I love this. Uh, I would, this is what I'd like to do. And so I was very lucky in three years later to uh, uh, the uh, Oxford Appointments Board. I was very interested. Christopher McCain said that he actually um, he got a job in, uh, at the Oxford times I think it was uh, through the appointments board and I got a, a job at Weidenfeld and Nicholson through the appointments board so it, you know that, another piece of luck. And this was uh, you were becoming a publisher um, about with history as your your prime subject? Well luckily I was in the illustrated books department of Weidenfeld and Nicholson and one of the uh, projects that I was put onto was something called Kings and Queens of England uh, and it was uh, I, the idea was to get young academics uh, to write briefly on a king or queen and and then uh, and Antonia Fraser was the general editor but uh, and uh, I one thing I did actually uh, persuade them to do was to have these illustrated, these, these uh, books. And so uh, ha having got, uh, had them illustrated, I then had to write the captions. And uh, that's probably my beginning as a writer, writing career. And those books are still in print 50 years later. It's absolutely extraordinary. They lie in your study, don't they? They, they do. <laughs> um, and... Uh... Then you, so you were at Weidenfeld and Nicholson, then Sidgwick and Jackson. Uh, in between, briefly, I was part of, I joined the Thompson Group, uh, which, uh, which had f uh, various publishers. So Hamish Hamilton, Michael Joseph, Nelson's, George Rainbird and Sphere, which was the paperback uh, arm. And I worked for Sphere for a bit. And then I went to Sidgwick and Jackson after that. What's the book you're proudest of publishing? Well, two come to mind uh, at Sidgwick. Um, the first was uh, Edna Healy's uh, book on um, called Lady Unknown, which was a biography of Angela Bedeck Coutts. And Edna was then mar well, was married to Dennis Healy, and he was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And uh, she had been this this book was sitting for e every editorial meeting we had. You, it, it, we sort of said yes this book's coming this book's coming and then uh, but it, it wasn't coming it wasn't coming and then H Hamish Hamilton suddenly announced they were going to do a book about Angela Bedeck Coots so we had to leap into action and uh, go and corner Edna in number 11 Downing Street and um, and get her to get the book sorted out and it was her first book uh, so she was absolutely wonderful lovely person but to not not at all experienced in right in, in writing so and um, we got it we, we did it and it was a great success so I'm very proud of that uh, and pleased we, we did it and then the book that actually I'm um, 
picked up out of, uh, from an agent was called uh, Seeds of Change and it was by Henry Hobhouse and it was about how um, five seeds changed the, changed the history of the world and then uh, um, it included uh, um, the potato uh, which the greening of America and sugar of course and uh, coffee uh, and tea uh, and uh, I thought that was a really interesting um, approach it's been of course people have have now ch uh, copied that so we have the history of the cod and we have the history of the uh, potato crisp <laughs> but but that was at the beginning it's a very famous book well I was I was very I thought it was absolutely fascinating and, and I was very pleased to do it to, to, to uh, publish it with your publishing hat on what are authors like? Are they difficult? Do they understand why they, they need editing? Um, what are they like? Some of them, some of them. So, so uh, a bit like Mary, uh, you know, with a curl, some, you know, they were good, they were very, very good, and when they were bad, they were wicked, and some of them were definitely very difficult. Uh, but uh, um, Edna, for instance, uh, was, was, she knew she needed editing and so it was an absolute joy to work with. Uh, and, uh, but there are others, uh, perhaps I shouldn't mention some of them, uh, but who were extremely difficult uh, because they didn't, either they didn't recognise that they couldn't uh, write or they, um, uh, or they inexperienced in writing uh, or they uh, um, were just difficult. But um, so, so I did have probably more difficult uh, authors in some ways at the National Trust because they were the experts that the National Trust wanted to, to, to write the books but not always uh, very experienced in writing so. Have you actually had to kind of write the whole book or rewrite the whole book so that it was yours rather than an author's? Yes. I did, yes, there is, uh, the, the author is no longer with us, so I can probably, I had to write, um, had to rewrite a book uh, um, uh, called, the, uh, which was about the flower arranging in National Trust houses, which I thought was rather fascinating, but, uh, and, but she, and she was, she had been working on this book for years and years and years, but she just really, it, I had to sort of do quite a lot, and, and in fact it came out at her, at her, uh, um, publishing party she's extremely well connected and so a, very, a famous novelist said I just don't un who was her cousin said I just don't understand because this person is illiterate and somebody said uh Cherchez the editor <laughs> <laughs> oh a tribute at least you've acknowledged and um, of course history publishing has changed a lot and you were you did illustrated books but the the, the physical way a uh, history book looks, a popular history book looks, has changed enormously in the last 50 years because, uh, because of printing advances, hasn't it? Yes, it has. And especially uh, you're able to integrate colour in, uh, and black and white with the, with the text. Although, interestingly, recently my books, uh, Yale have, have put the, uh, have had the uh, pictures on coated on on different kind of paper so in sections which sometimes um it it it's it, it's so much better for production because uh, it's the quality of the paper it, the paper can so often have uh, have the ink sinking into the into the page so they have actually um put put, put the pictures in sections recently i've noticed now you went off to the National Trust and it's a big business, uh, maybe a shrinking business at the moment, but a mm. big business and you were the publisher. So you were in charge of what? Not just the guidebooks, which is kind of what one thinks of, but you launched a National Trust imprint, did you? Yes, I did. So, so uh, initially I was, I was producing the uh, mem members uh, literature, which was things like the handbook, the magazine, and uh, the guide, and, the, and then the, and the guidebooks, but then um, I uh, felt that we really should have have our own imprint, because the uh, arrangement up till uh, uh, when I arrived was that uh, all, uh, various publishers, and one of them I think is 
is is here in, in the uh, is one of the people attending this. Um, they they published the books for the National Trust. But what I found when I got there was the the man who had it was my predecessor had died, uh, and I found that there were twenty six different books, all saying National Trust book of with with. 16 different publishers so it was absolute you know it was it was uh, pretty chaotic so uh, i i managed to persuade them that i should have we should have our own imprint and this was a time when um book clubs were were big it, book clubs have, have diminished almost entirely uh, book club associates for instance so they would take large quantities of books and also I had a um, was able to have a special relationship with um, somebody called Paul Gottlieb who was at Harry Abrams who was the big big uh, trade uh, uh, illust big illustrated book publishers in America and he took you know 5,000 10,000 copies of the book so it was absolutely fantastic because you also have, of course, your, you have a limited number of, of outlets. You can have a bestseller with just uh, 100, 200 um, uh, National Trust shops, can't you, if it works? Yes, although I always found the National Trust shops were very reluctant to, <laughs> to sell many of the books. <laughs> it was ongoing, relation, ongoing um, difficulties because they loved uh, selling remaindered books. Uh, which was because they like cheap books, you know, so that, that was that was their uh, So we had an interesting relationship Of course, that's one of the tensions of the National Trust is the number of Volunteers who uh, there's a great volunteering ethos in the National Trust as well as you coming in with uh, uh, Very strict professionalism and there's a con there's a tension there isn't there? It was terrific tension. Um, there, were, there were all kinds of tensions because the uh, education department wanted everything to be given free. The uh, the enterprises would like the books as cheap as possible, and the conserv uh, the curators wanted the books to be authoritative and you know were uh, and uh, quite uh, limited. So they they wanted uh, books that uh, uh, had uh, well they wanted good quality high quality books so it was it, it sometimes with limited um, appeal so it was it was very much uh, sort of uh, various directions. It, it sounds as though you had a, a job on your hands in bringing all this together into some kind of coherence did you manage did you do it? I'm not sure I'm not, I think you'll have to ask other people. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 um, I mean, one of the things I used to say, describe one of the departments was was well, two of the departments. I always describe the departments of the National Trust as being like the sons of Edward the Third. So, uh, the, inevitably, the Wars of the Roses. So there was one department which was called the it was known as the Lily, which was the curators, uh, and the, another one which was the, uh, the manage, managing agents, which was called the Boot. So it was the Lily and the Boot were always fighting each other as well. So I think you get the picture. But you got books out despite all these, um, uh, all of this, this War of the Roses. There was the rose, yes, yes, I did. You, 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 you managed to publish a lot of books in your yes, what, yes, years there. Yes, I, I published a lot of books. I, I started the imprint, I think, in about 1987, and I left in 2005. And if you can see, I mean, the bookcase behind has got many of those books in it. So, and, the, and the point of them was to, um, well, certainly break even, but also to add one of, like tea towels, one of the income flows for the trust, was it? Yes, it was. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. And you managed that too? Yes. <laughs> I never knew quite how much I did know because the de finance department wasn't very good at knowing, uh, understanding about publishing. It was quite interesting. I better not go into too much detail. <laughs> Because the Trust is now in the news, badly hit by COVID-19, shedding um, many of its uh, curatorial experts, it seems, and uh, almost embarrassed by its stately home rule, uh, role. Um, to say nothing of uh, the, the slavery business, how much of the wealth that built the great country houses uh, came from dubious sources. So, uh, um, you're probably glad you're not working there now. What do you make of this? Uh, it's it's a huge organisation. 
Yes, and I just, I just think it's terribly difficult. And, but I do think that what, is it, what they seem to have done with the business about the curators is that somebody leaked it before they pro pro properly sorted it all out. Because I did speak to one of the curators and asked her whether she's got a job still. And she said, we, we, none of us really know what, you know, we, we're sort of going to have to go in and find out just what is being suggested and what, whether, you know, we can, we can um, uh, change, uh, alter things. It's quite a difficult organisation to actually define. It started off what on on land really in the mm -hmm. in the Lake District, and then it started adding houses. There was the great um, crisis of the English country house in the 1950s and 60s, and the trust kind of kind of rode into that. And then it started expanding, and it's been membership has been growing like fury over the decades hasn't it mm, yeah when I, I i remember when i was uh, the, when i was at the trust um, the uh, marketing uh, person uh, saying I, I he thought we might plateau at a million and now it's it's it, well it was four or five million which is huge uh so uh, it's it's uh, um, and and that's difficult because people want different things from it yeah is it uh, is it uh... Disneyland or uh, <laughs> or, or, or uh, curatorial uh, discovery of uh, new things on old walls. Uh, um, what's it for? It needs redefining really and maybe that's what they're trying to do with this uh, mm. this shrinkage forced upon them by COVID-19. Yeah, yes. I, I had to do a SWOT exercise. I remember we had to do these SWOT exercises in, uh, and, uh, and I, one of them uh, they perceived threats, and I, my perceived threat was possibly that the that Ireland should be united um, because Northern Ireland is national trust, and then Southern Ireland era has its own organisation, and it is regarded as frivolous by 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 the uh, by the person, not by the person running it, but by my boss. And but actually, you know, who would have guessed that this threat? COVID, I mean, makes unification of Ireland look positively small scale. It shows the cracks in so many organisations, parts of society, politics, everything. It's a quite extraordinary thing, this, and it's going to, that sort of impact is going to linger for a very long time. Um, you retired 10 years ago. And 15, since, 15. 15 years ago. And since then, <laughs> you've been a very, very prolific writer. Um, had you been planning what you were going to do when you retired after, after battling the Wars of the Roses <laughs> for so long? Was it nice, a nice sort of sedentary, thinky occupation? I thought I was going to, uh, first thing I did was went and lived in Italy for three months to get over it all. And then I thought, well, I, I would, um, I would, probably do some proofreading and editing but the publisher at the British Library said well you know you, you you've been writing uh, under other people for some time why don't you write something yourself uh, and uh, uh, under your own name and he, uh, and because he was the publisher at the British Library I suggested that we, I might do something about how people found out about books um, and that transformed itself into reading matters um, but uh, he, he, he didn't actually publish the book, but he, he, he got me going and then Yale very luckily said that they would publish it. So that's how it started. And this was a, a scholarly but popular uh, history of reading? Yeah, so it was it was about yes it was about how pe people used had catalogues uh, uh, um, the books uh, it was it was how people discovered books so I, I took case histories and quite a lot of them were national trust I mean I used um, one from Dun and Massey uh, and then Pepys in his library and how he found out about his books and how he went to his bookseller in St Paul's churchyard and and discussed what books were coming out. So it was a, it was a, it was sort of about the marketing and discovery of books. As, so it wasn't just it's it's kind of a history of reading, but on a from a certain angle. Absolutely, at the heart of the stationers, of course. 
Yeah, yes, indeed. <laughs> so, uh, and that's where I became fascinated by the idea of St Paul's Churchyard being the, uh, the, uh, the centre of the book trade, and that's why I became a, a, a stationer. We'll come to St St Paul's Churchyard later on. Um, now, a publisher, to look backwards for a moment, has a lot of books and various uh, degrees of um, preparation, whereas an author, lonely life, working on one big thing. Isn't it more fun being a publisher? Don't, once you start writing, you realise that I was having more fun before? No. <laughs> I've had much more fun as a writer and in fact uh, in the last in the last um, six or seven months uh, it, it's been keeping me going um, I really you know it's because you've become totally absorbed and it also it's like a, a detective story you know you get on the trail of something and you're absolutely you know it's absolutely wonderful sort of pursuing the trail uh, slightly um uh, a difficult question. Do you need editing? Yes. <laughs> uh, because what I found, uh, what I've discovered is that actually doing the research is fairly straightforward, especially if you're experienced in it. But uh, it's the shaping of the book that's, um, that's the difficult thing. And that's what I've really, uh, when I first started, I really needed a lot of help on, on, on shaping the book. Books. Especially when the illustrations are involved, of course. Uh, yeah. The publisher has one idea and you, as a discoverer, have another idea, perhaps. Yes, yes but also trying to just make it a, a narrative and, and, and get everything fitted in. Um, that's really difficult. Now, you've gone on to write some very elegant books about uh, gardens, Samuel Pepys and John Evelyn, Hackney, and the reading book, and books about flowers and plants. These are all personal interests that grow out of each other, are they? Well, what happened was, uh, uh, because, of, because I had been the publisher at the National Trust, when we used to go to the Frankfurt Book Fair, uh, uh, we, we, there was what we described as Heritage Alley, which was all, the, where they put all the uh, publishers who like English Heritage and the British Library and the Bodleian Library. Uh, the, I used to share a stand with the Victoria and Albert Museum. And um, so I got to know all these publishers. And so obviously the British Library publisher was the one who suggested that I should do, I should read, uh, write reading matters. Uh, and then uh, the, the Bodleian Library um, man appeared one day. He, ha he was really an expert on Anglo-Saxon English. Uh, but uh, he had been made the publisher at the Bodleian Library. And so we became friends. And uh, so it was he who got me onto the, the botanical side because he was saying to me that they had this wonderful collection of um, botanical books and uh, illustrations in the plant sciences department at Oxford. But he couldn't work out how to put them over to the general public. So I said, as an editor, uh, what you should do is get a, um, uh, a flower painting from the Ashmolean, one of those Dutch flower paintings, and deconstruct it, and then tell the story of, say, 12 of the flowers, and how, and how they, they, were, they were treated in, in books and by, uh, by um, her herbalists and botanists. And he said, right, you can do that. So that's, that was this book, which I'm very embarrassed, is called Pick of the Bunch, the story of 12 treasured flowers. I told him that I didn't like the title. And as one of my friends said, very interflora, but he persisted. He now says he was wrong. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, the, the, have to underline the very strong relationship between the Bodleian Library and the stationers, because this is a great historical link isn't it? It is indeed and, and of course there's a particular link on the botanical side which is that um, the Gerard's Herbal which is the great English herbal that was published in 1597. It's published by John Norton of 
blessed memory who we we celebrate every year when we have uh, cakes and ale um, and he he was so pleased with it was a terribly difficult book for him to do I, as a publisher I really really sympathize because well first of all John Gerard got accused of plagiarism and then uh, uh, he had to borrow 1800 woodcuts from a, a Frankfurt book Book, uh, uh, publisher to illustrate the book and it's a huge project but he got it out in the end and he was so proud of it that he had a copy hand coloured by women and children 1800 woodcuts uh, for Sir Thomas Bodley for his new library and so I was able to use that for the Shakespeare Botanical Shakespearean Botanical, which I published with the Bodleian, and now with this new book, The Domestic Herbal. A lot of the pictures are from that, uh, from that herbal. I'll well, come to that in a second. You mentioned uh, the Shakespeare's Botanical. That was a kind of surprise bestseller, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Um, uh, and because the, uh, the publisher, the Bodleian, um, Samuel, he did a, he he made it did a, something very bold he decided he's going to make it very extremely good price so it was 12 pounds 99 but he had to print 30,000 copies in order to do that apparently the accountant practically passed out on the spot but uh, but it sold and it was reprinted so yes it's been reprinted at least twice once twice i think went down a treat in America too. Yes it did, yes. Uh, yes, Bodleian um, uh, represented in America by Chicago um, uh, University Press and they carried Kew Gardens books so they knew what they were doing so it was fantastic. And and because it's an interesting way of looking at Shakespeare, what a what a, uh, a country lad he was, how um, flowers uh, were deeply in his in his head weren't they? Yes they were so he used the, the local names for flowers so um, the uh, so light, love lies uh, sorry love in idleness which is the the flower that's so important in Midsummer Night's Dream uh, love in idleness is the is the Warwickshire name for for um, the uh, I'm trying to remember what it is <laughs> was it the it was the pansy wasn't it I can't remember. Do you know? Isn't that terrible? I'm going to have to look that I'm up. Going to look at the book. <laughs> uh, and then you, and then you went on to. Um, well, you didn't go straight on to the domestic herbal, but um, and in fact, I'll, I'll, I won't go on to that yet. Um, the, 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 the. Uh, there's the curious world of Pepys and John Evelyn which is about the minds of two people who were friends and um, and diarists too. It's a it's a wonderful um, uh, way of looking at uh, that period of history, isn't it? Well, yes, because they they are the most amazing chroniclers. I mean, very different in their approach, which made it interesting. And Pepys is just extraordinary. I mean, the more I think about him, the more extraordinary he was. I mean, this, and and as, as it came out again in the domestic herbal, which I used him as uh, as a wonderful source for all kinds of arcane information, like uh, his wife getting up and. Um, at three o'clock in the morning at the beginning of May to go to Woolwich to to uh, uh, get hold of uh, May Dew to put on her face which because she considered this was particularly fine for her complexion and I did actually discovered that um, when I was telling some friends about this that the girls at Benenden school used to do this every May which is why they've got such lovely complexions <laughs> But, but but there was there's there's been there have been recent notable biographies of both Evelyn and Pepys. So you had to avoid that. You found another way of looking at them. Yes, I, absolutely. I mean, I hope so. Yes, because I look, I I took their different their 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 interests, and of course their interests weren't always the same. I mean, Pepys is no is famous for not being a gardener. Uh, and his one one horticultural activity was to bury the Parmesan cheese in the back garden, when the uh, Great Fire of London was threatening um, to get to, to consume his house in Seething Lane. 
Um, so so he, he, he was not a gardener, whereas John Evelyn was a great gardener and a great writer of gar about gardens. Different attitudes to um, sex, of course, Evelyn and, and uh, Pepys. Yes, uh, and in, but interestingly, because Pepys, well, we know so much about Pepys's sex life, uh, but um, his wife died uh, uh, and he then stopped writing his diary but he did um he then had a long relationship with somebody called uh, uh, mary skinner who was a uh, um who never married him and uh, people who uh, people always say why didn't he marry her and i think she didn't marry him because she was a woman of independent means and that was very unusual in 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 um, uh, uh, 17th century in england and she meant, meant that she was in charge of her own fortune and her own uh, destiny uh, but um, she was actually accepted by uh, it, his friends as his partner uh, and it's a wonderful line in, in John Evelyn. He describes it, her as Mr. Pepsi's inclination, which I thought was rather, absolutely lovely. Quite wonderful. Who would you have uh, preferred as a friend, Pepys or Evelyn? Really hard. I think I would have enjoyed Pepys's company more because e Evelyn had some very uh, kind of, you know, he'd always referred to women as the weaker vessel uh and and uh but really difficult i'm not sure they both had their <laughs> their uh, uh you know sort of uh shortcomings but, but i think I, how, how wonderful to be able to get get into their minds so to speak with the with this book to have to to have to do this Yes, I, I suppose as a, as a female writer, I suppose it's rather, I am party pre really. But, uh... Now, here's the latest book from the Bodleian Library, The Domestic Herbal, Plants for the Home in the 17th Century, with a lot of Gerard's herbal in it, but not just Gerard. This, this is, because herbs were, herbs were important, weren't they? They were vital absolutely vital and it's been interesting now thinking about about now that we live in a time of pandemic you know just how important they were and the plague and how people were trying desperately to find ways of of, of dealing with the plague and drinking uh, what they call plague water which was a, a distilled water probably from um from rue which seems to be in the herb that they thought was was um uh, important. Um, Artemisia, some people think that Wormwood now still has has something, a, a part to play in, in our current um, desperate search for for uh, something to deal with coronavirus. And, and one, Go on, yeah. one of the most frightening things I, when I, I, which I haven't didn't have in the book but I wish I had used was uh, with these plague doctors who used to um, Used to get, they used to wear these extraordinary masks, which look like the, those masks that in Venice with these, with these huge long beaks, which they used to put herbs into the beak, so that they could, you know, from from their point of view, it was it was like you know having a mask with with, with some with uh, some protection. It must be absolutely terrifying for people who were suffering from the plague or ill in any way. They, the masks weren't compulsory though, were they? <laughs> no, they weren't compulsory. Only in the shop. Because <laughs> you've got herbs for medicine, for syrups, for brewing, dyeing, laundering, and for bringing scents into dirty, dirty homes. Um, did you try a lot of herbs when you were doing this? Did you have to try things you wouldn't otherwise have wanted to do? No, I don't think I did. <laughs> we were going to have what, what one of the great sadnesses about about the about the uh, the uh, lockdown was that we were going to have uh, the archive evening. Um, we were going to do day, uh, life at the time of uh, life in 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 uh, uh, stations company, and, I, uh, and it grew out of this whole business about strewing the hall because. Ruth, our archivist, found these wonderful references to herb women um, using, uh, bringing herbs into the hall for the feast, uh, the election feast in, in, in August. 
and so Carl, uh, our beetle, got very excited and thought perhaps we could have a have some strewing. So we were going to have a a, 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 a little little bit of strewing, not not over the whole hall. He would have been sweeping it up forever afterwards, but it would have been things like wormwood and uh, mint, which mice hate and uh, wormwood was uh, fleas and moths hated and then lavender which is lovely scent and Gordon was going to bring us in wonderful lavender from Cambridge uh, and uh, the one that I really wish I, I have never smelt it but meadow sweet was apparently so powerful that people faint fainted sometimes with it because it was so powerful well and, we have to have have that sort of thing for the next feast we have in uh... Involved. Let's do it. Let's do it. Whatever, whatever the subject is, or whatever it's about, let's uh, let's have it. Because there's this interesting disclaimer in this book right at the beginning, not intended. It says this book is not intended to provide medical or other health advice for readers, and, men, and none of the remedies included here is recommended for use without expert advice. So you wash your hands of what you say, do you? Well, I had no. Uh, this was this was ad strongly advised by a rather, rather um, uh, a serious uh, lady who's expert on herbal medicines at one of the uni at Exeter University. And she said, "You really must put this in." I, I got told off by her for putting, um, uh, putting saying that some of the recipes were gruesome, because there's, there's one recipe for hair making your hair, um, stopping your hair falling out, which where you have to sort of, uh, you, you have uh, horse leeches and, and fleas and all kinds of ghastly things and you kind of uh, make them, uh, I can't think of the word, you know, uh, uh, fermented and then, and then you mix them with other things. And there's another one where you have to, uh, uh, snails, where you bash the snails and get the snails out and then you have to clean them, get all the, with with a with a, 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 a bodkin, and I think they're pretty horrible. Some of the recipes, some of the things you had to do, but she she thought that gruesome was not was was me sort of putting my view onto the seventeenth century. And you got somebody else to taste the lampreys. Yes, yes, I did. Yes, uh, but lampreys are are not eels. They're 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 uh, there are in. Uh, they're not. They're an invertebrate. Uh, Henry the First famously died from a surfeit of them, apparently, and they uh, and they they suck um, their prey, uh, and they uh, they're on the bottom of the uh, river, and so they're very sandy. But they do taste like eels, apparently, and and in Galicia they're a particular um, delight for the Galicians. But you haven't tasted them. I haven't, but Pepys did, and he said it was a very rare dish, and he. It was part of his stone feast. You know, he had this feast every year uh, to celebrate the fact that he survived cutting for the stone. You, you talk about um, uh, herbal uses. Uh, um, I remember that uh, when I was a boy, my mother used to collect rainwater from a butt and then put rosemary in to wash our hair with because she said it made it shinier. And it went on for years, this. and. It's we can see it obviously has, it's worked <laughs> but but it's a deep a deep seated thing that goes right back to to herbals like this and of course the herbal you mentioned how many illustrations colored ones were in the uh, thomas bodley version uh, the thomas bodley edition of the uh, gerard herbal this was a coffee table book effectively it wasn't oh, yes yes this was this was yeah you, you, it was very expensive it was pr probably at 10 pounds it cost which at the time was an enormous amount of money. That's, uh, um, and it was, it, so it was, the, the, that and, uh, and the other coffee table book at the time, rather strangely, was Fox's Book of Martyrs, which you, you, you it had all those horrible pictures of, of Protestant martyrs being burnt by um, Mary, Mary Tudor and her bishops. Uh, and uh, th these, was, these were the two books that people left in wills to to their uh, to daughters probably with Gerard's herbal and sons with Fox's Book of Martyrs. 
Another thing uh, in the book is dyes, isn't it? I said most dyes were coloured dyes were vegetable until the nineteenth century, weren't they? Nearly yes, everything. yes, yes. The chemical dyes really come in with the uh, with mauve and and in the nineteenth century and other the Germans were very good on chemical dyes. But yes, yeah, so so uh, uh, some of them uh, rose rose madder was the red, and then woad was blue and particularly uh, uh, antisocial. The poor men who had to try and uh, create uh, the woad from in, in mills, Elizabeth I wouldn't have them within three miles of where she was living. It was stinky. Stinky, yes. And, and of course they faded. They were the, the coming of um, uh, chemical dyes in the 19th century meant you couldn't ease so readily identify the poor in the street anymore because the poor always had faded that's an clothing. interesting point very interesting yes that's interesting yes because black was black and red really were the colors of the, Stuart, uh, the of the 17th century the, uh, because they were distinguished and logwood came from which was a diet was good and didn't didn't fade but was incredibly expensive that came from south america well there's all sorts of stuff in this beautiful book it is a real pleasure uh, to look at uh, and to read um but let's go on to your what you're working on at the moment because that's and i'd hoped we were going to do this from stationers hall even even as a uh, uh, a zoom encounter because um the book is about everything around stationers hall isn't it it is yes that's right yes Tell us about it. well it's a history of st paul's churchyard uh and um and uh, I, the publishers uh, the peer review for yale said i've got to i was to go right through so i start in the anglo-saxons and i doggedly go through to uh to the, the terrible um uh bombing in 1940 when Paternoster Row and, and St Paul's Churchyard really uh, almost totally destroyed that northeast part but Stationers Hall survived amazingly along with the cathedral and the, what what the uh, was called it was called the chapter house um, so yes it, uh, I, I've been living with St Paul's Churchyard for the last three years and I'm just finishing it and I'm finding it really quite hard to let go of it <laughs> because you go right up to date you go right up to occupy don't you yes yes indeed yes um and i of course now i'm going to have what is going to be the f future of st paul's churchyard um i the, the problem with it as, as a physical in it, it lost its architectural integrity with the bombing so we've got Paternoster Square, which is very different from the southern part, which is uh, uh, gardens. The only bit where you get the feeling of what it must have been like is, is the uh, West End, where uh, um, the two parts sort of kind of curve round. One, one's Edwardian and the other was built in the 1970s, I think, where, where, where Marks and Spencer and, um, and the bank is. Oh. <laughs> Um, so, so uh, it, it's it's what what is going to be the future for St Paul's Churchyard? Well, won't it just become more and more park-like? It has the most wonderful wisteria in it. Does it? Hmm. Where, it's where? <laughs> white, well, it, and, white and uh, lilac wisteria, stupendous. Um, but um, yeah. It, it still has its its ancient status though, which is why Occ Occupy was there. They were kicked out of Paternoster Square, they wanted to uh, protest about the stock exchange, yes. so they uh, they went to the place where they had, well, very deep-seated rights to squat, didn't they? I, I don't know, I mean I, have, I, I asked Charles Fraser that, uh, whether they knew about the protest movements from the Middle Ages and 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 indeed in uh, right through um uh, 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 gordon riots and all that kind of uh, uh, the, the, those protests um and he said that they the, the occupy leaders did were aware of this but he didn't say whether that whether this was a, a right for them or not and unfortunately he hasn't answered my my follow-up email so i don't quite know i'd like to know more about 
what rights they what 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 they felt they when the, what what there was in their minds when they when they moved to the to the churchyard but it's quite difficult to find out so i'd be most grateful if anybody could help me on this they used to have uh, debates every afternoon about it it was uh, it was a quite intense sort of debating club occupy and uh, well i've tried to look them up and, and I, I couldn't i couldn't find anything that specifically was about this there are two two men aren't there who were very much the leaders of uh, uh, um, i can't remember their names i've got their names here but if you can help me with this, it would be wonderful, Peter. Or somebody, somebody else, somebody in the in the audience. Let, uh, let's um, uh, let's go back to the stationers, though, because it always seems slightly odd to me that it that the word stationer, stationary, came from those those tethered carts that didn't have to be packed away at the end of the trading day in the marketplace in St Paul's in Old St Paul's churchyard. But it's true, isn't it? Yes, and it, I did, um, Peter Blaney, who know, who knows all about it, says he, he doesn't he doesn't really know what why because there must have been other stalls. Yes, exactly. Uh, but but why the stationers got the, you know why booksellers and and uh, pamphleteers got the uh, got the name, and of course uh, when we when we do open house, people are always rather sort of uh, uh, they they don't quite know what to make of it. So, uh, the people who come to visit. They, they um, think it's something to do with W.H. Smith. Yeah, as as does Google, I think, when you uh, you try searching for the stationers. Um, uh, and then publishing just grew up round about it because, because of a few people selling paper and ink and parchment and stuff on cuts. And, 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 and writing of the scribes. And so the, 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 the kind of the great link was when uh, Winkin de Word moved his press, the presses from Westminster Abbey, where uh, he'd um, inherited them from William Caxton, uh, and moved, uh, moved to uh, uh, the Sign of the Sun in Fleet Street. Uh, and, um, he, and that was the, that, that then brought the two, the, the suppliers, the craftsmen, and the, the means of producing together. It was a light bulb moment. <laughs> and Wicked Word had to be a stationer to do that because that's why Caxton started his press in Westminster was that had he opened in the city of London, the boys from the stationers would have been round in about half an hour to smash his press up, wouldn't they? Um, no, not really, oh. because... <laughs> I, I hesitate to suggest this because he was, of course, he was a, a draper, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah. Um, the, the mystery of stationers at the time weren't, had, did, weren't connected with printing at all. They had so, uh, and, and Winkin de Word was never a. Yes, he became a stationer. Yes, that's right. He became a stationer. Yeah. He and Richard Pinson were the first two printers who joined the stationers' company. Um, uh, and and uh, and then the link became uh, became that then the smashing up would have, would have occurred. Yes, that's right. There's, there's also some slightly tenuous theory that the uh, reason so many authors clustered around Fleet Street was that it was near the River Fleet, which was so sticky from Smithfield, from all the offal that was thrown in, that it was the cheapest lodgings in the whole of London. So <laughs> indigent, indigent authors had garrets up there. It was before the stationers invented copyright, of course, and gave them money for their, their authorship. Well, and, sta um, stationers weren't too generous with their, with their giving of copyright. <laughs> but it was the smell of the fleet that... Uh, that Interesting. Uh, produced Fleet Street. That's something somebody told me anyway. <laughs> but you're doing, you've, you've got this great narrative and it's uh, uh, it's on time and on budget, this book you're writing, this new book, isn't it? It is. It, it's supposed to be delivered at the end of the year, but I think I'm going to be delivering it three months early. So um, I'm you're very strange. A half percentage point on your royalties. <laughs> Um, I, I'm going to miss it. I, I mean, you know, I, I, I just—it's uh, it, been such a, an interesting thing to do, and I've discovered all kinds of fascinating um, information. Um, uh, and uh, and um, 
because Paternoster Row became the place for all the publishers. They were shoved out of out of the churchyard by the textile warehouses in the 19th century. So, so, uh, so the churchyard was the citadel of the textile trade, which is which came as rather a surprise to me. Right, and of course, then the Great Fire, led, running with lead from the roof of St Paul's, and set the set to blaze. Uh, an enormous stock of books from the um, the stationers in the uh, in some faiths, yes, yes, yeah, you know, quite extraordinary um, threat to the whole of the publishing industry at the time. Indeed, well, um, and but I've I've been uh, uh, Ruth has found a very very interesting um, document which uh, sh uh, of, of the recovery is the almanacs that they really you know uh, was absolutely fascinating. So. That, that uh, the number of almanacs that they they sold was absolutely huge. So uh, they, they they went to Cambridge and got uh, the, the, the uh, Cambridge to help them to to uh, um, resupply because they lost so much. So it's all new, good stuff. It's all it's all in the new book. But the book we are celebrating particularly tonight is this one, the domestic herbal. Thank you ever so much, Margaret. That was quite fascinating. Um, uh, come back and tell us more about the uh, the new book uh, whenever it's published uh, next year or the year after. But it'll be next year, won't it? You're so hope so. As you've, as you've written it so fast. Uh, back to Mike now. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you guys. I mean, that was absolutely fan fantastic and fascinating. We are just so lucky to have Margaret and Peter as, as members of the station as friends and uh, another very interesting evening. So as I said earlier, the, the books are available for sale. What I will do tomorrow is everybody will actually get an email with all of Margaret's seven books. Particularly, I would recommend the Domestic Herbal, which is £25. And as we said earlier, the, the Shakespeare one as well, the Shakespeare Botanical, which is at... Um, which is at £10, which is an exceptionally good price. So wait for those. And if you get your orders in as quickly as possible, I'd appreciate that and we'll get them signed. Um, our next cocktail hour is with Court Assistant Jonathan Drury on Wednesday, the 21st of October. He, like Margaret, has had an absolutely fascinating career. And his book, Around the World in 80 Trees, is, a, is another great read. And he has another book coming out in April. And in November, we have the master, the Reverend Stephen Platten, not talking about his career as a stationer, but talking about his many, many published works. And you are in for some surprises there, I'm sure. So before I close, so many thanks to um, Margaret and Peter, and thank you for everybody to join us tonight. But perhaps I could read you a quote from um, Margaret's book. One of the things that stationers are very passionate about is, is wine. And wine mentions, is mentioned in, in Margaret's book. Uh, although perhaps the wine committee wouldn't be too happy with, with this quote. And I read, in London, Rhenish wines was landed in barrels at Vintner's Wharf near London Bridge. These wines were never clarified nor matured before sale but drunk young. As such, they were treated in a way that we consider cavalier, often with the addition of sugar, herbs and fruit. Sack according to Shakespeare, the favourite tipple of Falstaff was Seco, a dry white wine from Spain, to which the fat knight added sugar so much as a matter of course that one of his companions referred to him as Sir John Sack and Sugar. Well, I'm just about to go off now to share a social distancing glass of wine with, with Peter and Margaret, hopefully with not too much sugar and too many herbs, but perhaps it, another quote from Margaret's book, as my wife is on this call as well, um, is, from Pe is from Peeps. And Peeps' reference is to raspberry sack, which he consumed with some sausages on an outing with his wife to watch a puppet performance of Ben Johnson's Bartholomew Fair. Now, I've never actually tried this excuse, but I'm going to try this later on tonight. After his meal in November 1661, they returned home very, very merry. The possibility was that raspberry was at <laughs> his wine. So hopefully no raspberry we added to my wine tonight. Thank you everybody for joining us. Margaret and Peter, superb. Thank you very much. And I'll see you all again in October. Good night. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>